Hi, my name is Damien Webb. I'm the Manager of Indigenous Engagement here at the State Library of New South Wales and my family are Palawa from Tasmania. Atsalone Protocol 3, uh, Intellectual Property. So this protocol um, is largely about recognising Indigenous copyright and intellectual property. So um, that extends to quite formal, um, quite complicated frameworks that are being developed at the moment that specifically recognise it. But at its heart, it's about recognising agency and authority of uh, Aboriginal voices within the archives. So there are um, some, some examples, particularly things like the early language lists that were recorded, uh, often the informants, the Aboriginal informants whose language and knowledge was being recorded were not uh, even named. In instances where they were named, um, they're never given the same credit as the, the white ethnographer or the non-Aboriginal person that was collecting it. To this day, there are still Aboriginal collections defined by the non-Aboriginal person that collected them. Um, and what this does is continues that narrative of um, Aboriginal voices not being as sophisticated or as complex or as worthy of recognition as the white collectors or ethnographers, who in many cases were amateurs. Um, a lot of the collections that have been built up in, in our archives uh, were not by people that were necessarily informed, um, that knew what they were doing. They had an interest in, in the local Aboriginal culture or an ethnographic approach uh, and would go around collecting stories, taking photographs and recording all of this knowledge. In extreme cases that became a uh, revenue stream for these non-Aboriginal people. So there were publications built off the back of our knowledge that um, then made money for white authors. And those authors and researchers continue to this day to often have minimal engagement with Aboriginal communities and don't recognise the rights of our knowledge. So we'll have um, you know, photographs of rock art that's 15,000 years old, but the image and the use of that image is copyrighted to the granddaughter of a random settler that lived out there, completely failing to recognise that the knowledge within that photo is, is 15,000 years old, if not more. Uh, and so what that does is actually diminishes that knowledge in favour of um, the person that's taking the photograph. So again, reducing us to, to subjects and objects rather than, than free agents. For me, this, this protocol um, is one that I'm very passionate about. It gets to the, the heart of what is an imbalance in, in power, um, which is really at the heart of decolonising the archives, is recognising that power imbalance, is going back to these sources and actually acknowledging the vast amounts of knowledge. It's about treating that knowledge and what has been shared or recorded often without informed consent, seeing that as sophisticated and as complicated as um, white European culture. There's still a, a fairly pervasive view that our knowledge is uh, organic or transient or nomadic or, or isn't structured or rigorous the way that Western knowledge is. Um, and that, that view continues to be reinforced by the way that we treat our material, by the way that we show deference to white copyright holders but not to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who created the records. Short of enacting formal ICIP protocols, which is starting to take place across many institutions, um, what, what is important to me is that we are, as institutions, putting more pressure on non-Aboriginal donors and collectors to better recognise the knowledge that they are collecting or donating, that researchers that we work with are encouraged to seek our permission, even if the material seems safe and has been open access for many, many decades, that doesn't mean that it was actually created with informed consent, uh, and about really enacting that reflective prax practice as, as library staff. Um, that we've gotten very used to the processes being airtight and if it's after 1955 and out of copyright we can do what we like with it. Um, we haven't put enough effort into going back to that first step and really establishing the depth of knowledge contained within our collections and the rights and responsibilities um, that we have as custodians of that knowledge in the library. So recognising intellectual property and Indigenous copyright for me supports community self-determination and encourages community self-definition.